So the Schoon Project, I'll tell a little bit about it. I was in New York City about two and a half years ago and I met this young man by the name of William Stormont. And William is a 16th, 1-6th generation family member. And as we're chatting, he said, you know, it's very difficult being someone like me, you know, wealthy in a small community. It was in Perth, Scotland. He happens to be Scottish royalty, but that's besides the point. And he says, I've got lots of mates that, you know, have been educated well, and we have no one to talk to. You know, when you're part of a family business and you've got substantial wealth, you know, who do you really talk to? Do people talk to you because of who you are or because of who your family is or what the perceived wealth is? And he said, a lot of us, you know, have done the Harvard and the Cambridge and all the higher education stuff, but we don't really understand the emotional side of leadership. Could you help create a event that would be experiential in nature so we get to experience things? And we'll host it at my home at a place called Schoon Palace. I said, sure, I'd love to do that. So the first year we had 20 participants from nine countries come. And we talked about all of the emotional things. I'm going to say the F word. You guys ready? We talked about feelings. Okay, I know all of you have them. Some of you is buried way inside, but you have them. And it's okay to talk about them. Because feelings get in the way of business. And if you don't address the feelings, the business could eventually fail. So Safe Space is my fifth book. It's my best work by far. And the reason is, is because I'm really sitting in the concepts. I'm actually living them. People ask me, why'd you write a book called Safe Space? And it's really simple. It's because as a child, I didn't feel safe enough. I rarely felt safe as a child because of a whole bunch of events that occurred which molded me and shaped me to the man that I became and allows me to serve the way I serve. See, my personal life purpose is to create a safer world. And the vehicle that I choose to do it through is you, family businesses. Because if you feel safe as an individual and then you feel safe with your shareholders and your siblings and your parents and your cousins, you create a culture of safety in your business. And now we can truly transform the world. Because isn't that what we're all here to do, is to transform the world? That's why you create these businesses. That's why you learn. That's why you're here, is to transform. So the quest that I have for you, planting a seed for the next speaker, is what's your purpose? What are you here to really do? Because up until now, it's been a practice. 95% of the reason why business families fail to transfer is because of the emotional stuff. Your humanness gets in the way. 25% because you haven't prepared the errors. What are you doing to prepare the up and coming generation? And by the way, part of preparing errors is preparing yourself as the founding generation to let go. That's the other side of the equation. It's not all on them. It's your responsibility too, mate. What are you doing to emotionally let go? And then the other 15% are all the quantitative stuff, but that also involves behavioral because if you as, an, as a client, as a family, isn't really clear what matters most to you, how can your advisors plan for you? I've worked with business families across the globe for now 20 years. And I've had the chance to see what the successful ones do right, what they've got in place. And it's really simple. Every single family member is interviewed. Because one of our key desires as human beings is to feel seen, heard, and understood. And if we exclude a family member, that basic need is disrespected. And they're going to feel disenfranchised. And they're going to become rogue. My view on spouses is really simple. If you share a bed, they have influence, period. Now, it doesn't mean that the spouses have to be involved with the process on the onset. No. But at some point, 
You may want to include them. If they share a bed, they have influence. If you don't think that's true, you're living in Egypt and on the Nile. Every single family member attends the meetings with a coach present. I'm so glad to hear, Mike, that you've got coaches in place here to assist these folks. Because as a friend of mine once said, you can achieve nothing of significance on your own. If you want to do great things, you need a coach, you need a mentor, you need a Sherpa. You don't climb the top of a mountain on your own. You have a guide. Trusted communication is paramount. We have to be able to have a safe space to share our feelings. Because I fundamentally believe, and if you disagree, put your hand up on this one. I fundamentally believe that every single one of us wants to feel safe. We want to feel safe in our environments. We want to feel safe in our relationships. And we certainly want to feel safe with our wealth. Does anyone disagree with that? But yet, what gets in the way? Why do you think, what's the one reason why you don't tell the truth to another human being? What's the reason? You're afraid of them. You don't feel safe. Right? They don't want to hurt is part of it. But that's what we tell ourselves to justify not telling the truth. I'm not busting him, just saying that's what happens. Okay? If I don't feel safe with dad, and that dad's not going to get pissed off or, hurt or use it against me, I'll share with him. But if I have any sense of I don't feel safe, I'm not going to go there. And yet you want to trust each other. How can you trust each other if you don't feel safe? So the question I have for you, which is what am I going to write down, is how safe do I really feel with my relationships? It's okay to have feelings, guys. It's okay to have insecurities. That's why I started with that quote. Courage is not the absence of fear. Courage is the triumph over it. As I said earlier, how brave are you to face your fears and go to the next level? How brave are you to step into what's waiting for you? How brave are you to let go and let the next gen take over? How brave are you to be able to receive it? Human questions. The other common denominator is money. So the biggest risk to the system, actually, if we look at this from a lens of risk, what are some of the ownership risks? Just by show, just shell out. So ownership risk. Where's the lawyer? Lawyers will know this. Ownership risks. Is there a lawyer in the house? I thought there was. <laughs> what are some of the risks with ownership? Come on, guys. Rogue shareholders. Legislation changes. In Canada, we've got a government that wants to tax businesses. Hmm, someone's not thinking there. What's some of the risks in the business? Getting sued. Getting sued by your employees, by, other, by customers. What else? Another one. Competition. What's the risk in the family? Be nice. I'll start with the first one, the in-laws. It's always a risk, so I'll bring it out there. What else is a risk? Nepotism, entitlement, not sharing your feelings is a risk. But the biggest risk to the system is behavioral risk of the individual. So I'm going to take you through the three circle model of safety. And as I already shared, just to be playful, we developed this over copious bottles of wine. So the individual, the relationships, and the wealth. So let's define safety first. Safety means competent in one's abilities, both intellectually and emotionally. Confident in one's decision making, both intellectually and emotionally. Understands their triggers. We're going to get into that in a little bit more. But the triggers are, what's that default mechanism that you behave when you get triggered? As a friend of mine once said, you know, what do you get when you squeeze an orange? And the answer is orange juice. What do you get when you squeeze a human being? What they're really made of. Right? So if we were to squeeze TJ, for example, what he's made of is he doesn't trust people today, but that can change, right? Understands their money model, which is the emotional side of money that I talked about, and finally is comfortable dealing with conflict in a healthy manner. 
So the individual has to feel safe with themselves first. TJ has to feel safe with himself. In order for TJ to trust others, he's got to trust himself first. If he doesn't trust himself, he'll never trust another. Does that make sense? And how do we trust ourselves? When we say we're going to do something, we do it, period. You've got to feel safe with your advisors. You have to feel safe with the Dale High Center. You've got to feel safe with Mike and his team. The wealth has to be safely managed and positioned. And our definition of wealth is financial capital, which is the things, the human capital, which is individuals, plus the social capital, which is the collection of individuals, plus their collective brand and reputation. What I, I had a question when I uncovered the money model, when I created the money model um, concept, and the question was really simple. Is there a connection or correlation between how we do money and how we treat our money and how we do our relationships and how we treat our relationships? What do you think the correlation is? Correlation of one. They're directly correlated. How one does money is how one does relationships. I know that's a scary proposition for some of you. So how you treat your money is exactly how you treat your relationships. So, give you, so the, there's four categories. Everyone's got a very specific money model, but it'll fall into one of four categories. Number one's the investor. This individual, and by the way, this is in the book. So buy the book, because Mike's giving it to you at a good price, 20 bucks, the regular 40. Mike really bent my finger here, as you can tell. <laughs> um, so there's the investor. The individual that invests their money, they invest their time in relationships. They put in the time, they know that one day they may get a dividend. There is the spender. I used to be one of these guys, the one that spends their money and spends the relationship. I'm going to take from TJ, then I'm going to take from Tim, and then I'm going to go somewhere else. Now, there's a subcategory to this one. This is the one that spends it with themselves. And what they tell themselves is, I'm really giving. I'm giving all of me to people because I want to save the world but they're actually spending of themselves. And they're actually very resentful and angry at others because they realize that it's their own dysfunction that does it. But I'm doing it for the good of humanity. So the analogy is, I can't give you water from an empty vessel. It doesn't work. The third category is the value and respecter. This is the one that values and respects their possessions and values and respects their relationships. They're always checking in. You know, at least, how's the family? How's Mike treating you? Is he being good to you? Always checking it. And finally, the fear. The one that believes they don't deserve the good fortune of either relationships or wealth. So they, what do they do? Push aside or they'll self-sabotage. So this is the safe space equation. It's very, very simple. We'll have a core belief. I call it our core wound or our core insecurity that comes from that event that occurred in the past. And then that manifests as a gig. So the gigs is our natural response, our behaviors. And we all have a particular co combination of gigs we play, but there's six of them. These you want to write down. Actually, yeah, write them down. And then read about them in the book. So the first one is the avoider. And as I'm saying these, you may recognize yourselves, and you may recognize some of those that are close to you. So the avoider. Pretty self-explanatory. They avoid things, they postpone things. The second one is the people pleaser. They want to make everybody happy. They want to come and, and sing big kumbaya sessions all the time over marshmallows. It's very difficult being a people pleaser if you're leading a business, though. Because at some point, you're going to hurt someone, and you're going to piss someone off. The, set, the third one is what Dale talked about, is the rescuer. They want to come in in their white knight outfit and the beautiful white horse and save the day, because that's what they do. And there's a victim. Poor me. It's not my fault. It's the world that's bad. It's my brother that doesn't trust me. Not about me. Victim. There's a manipulator. They withhold information to gain favor. And finally, there's the right fighter. They fight to be right. They got to have the last word. So did you recognize yourself in these six categories? 
Yes? Oh, of course. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We, we danced like, you know, so I, I, you know, I used to be, you know, the, the, the manipulator and I used to be the rescuer and, oh, definitely the victim. Oh, poor me. And we dance around them. So, yes, we do. So, what are your top two? Write those down. What are the ones you like to play often and hang on to those and do your thing with? So, we talked about gigs. The mask. The mask, we all wear a mask. We all pretend that everything's great. That I'm a big, strong man. I don't have feelings. It's a classic one. Right? We've all got a mask. In actuality, the mask is the lie we tell ourselves to perpetuate the negative belief and to justify the poor behavior. Does that make sense? The mask is the lie we tell ourselves. In this case, the mask is the lie I tell myself to perpetuate the belief and to justify the negative behavior. So what is past the mask, the other side of it, is what I call safe space. And safe space, simplistically, is that what we wanted more of as a child and crave as an adult? Safe space is what we wanted more of as a child or didn't get enough of as a child and what we crave for as an adult. So you guys have heard my story. You've seen the title of the book. What do you think my safe space is? I'll give you a hint. It's in the title of the book. Safety. Because I wanted safety as a child. And what I want more as an adult is safety. I want to know that I feel safe with myself to be able to be in a relationship. Because if I don't feel safe with myself, the relationship won't work. And the natural tendency is to fall back into what wasn't safe. Does that make sense? Another way to think about safe space is what is it that others do or don't do that really pisses you off? So if you get really bothered when people don't tell the truth, chances are your safe space is integrity and honesty. If it bothers you that you know, they're not transparent, transparency is your safe space. If it bothers you that they're not authentic or real, your safe space is, 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 is authenticity and real. Now here's the thing with safe space. You can't fake it. Because as human beings, we're feeling beings. You know, Galileo says, you know, all truths are easy to understand. The key is to uncover them. What you're doing here is you're starting to uncover your truths. Or in some cases, your untruths. That's what this is about. Life's a journey. You're not going to get the answer right away. You didn't build a successful business in a week, did you? It took time. It took a lot of wrong turns. You scraped your knees. You failed. There's no difference here. But what kept you was you stayed, at the, you stayed on the game. You stayed on the path. You didn't quit. Because you knew what you wanted to do. It's the same with this. Become the champion of your life. Get to know yourself like no one else knows you. 